Hello there, I'm James Bayes. Iran has promised a response to Israel's recent attack on its consulate in the Syrian capital, Damascus. The US says it has intelligence that an attack is imminent and vows to defend Israel. For his entire political career, Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, has labelled Iran as his number one enemy. While leading a disastrous and brutal war in Gaza, killing and wounding more than 100,000 Palestinians, he's facing grave political threats at home. A criminal prosecution on fraud charges awaits if he's turfed out of office. Israel's military and political establishment and virtually everyone else will be fully aware that the Israeli strike against an Iranian diplomatic building could not have come at a more dangerous time. So what's next? What are the threats not just to the region but to the wider world? And can diplomacy calm things down? We'll be analysing the situation in full with our panel of guests in a few moments. But first, this report from Victoria Gatenby. The bombing of Iran's consulate building in Syria earlier this month marked a new stage in what's often described as a shadow war between Iran and Israel. Among the dead pulled from the rubble in Damascus were revolutionary guards, including one of Iran's highest ranking officers, Brigadier General Mohammad Reza Zahidi. He was in charge of Iran's Quds forces in Lebanon and Syria. Iran's supreme leader has threatened to retaliate. Regime Khabiz. The wicked Zionist regime made another mistake and staged an attack on Iran's consulate, which means an attack on the country's soil, a violation of international norm. It made a mistake, and the regime needs to be punished and will be punished. Wow. The Israeli army is on high alert. The Lebanese armed group Hezbollah launched more than 50 rockets from southern Lebanon towards Upper Galilee in northern Israel and the occupied Golan Heights on Friday. Israel launched a series of airstrikes in southern Lebanon in response. U.S. President Joe Biden says he expects Iran to attack Israel sooner rather than later. What's your message to Iran in this moment? Don't. We are devoted to the defense of Israel. We will support Israel. We will defend, help defend Israel. And Iran will not succeed. Analysts say Iran will likely respond in a way that deters Israel from similar attacks in the future, but avoids military escalation that could draw in the United States. Even if they do respond, it's very likely going to be with some level of coordination to make sure that it doesn't escalate, potentially. We actually don't know what's going to happen, but I think if you want to avert, avert a wider war, then it has to be calculated to not necessarily involve taking the lives of soldiers. Military confrontation would have serious and widespread global economic consequences given the region's importance to energy supplies and shipping routes. And there are fears the situation could lead to broader conflict in an already volatile region. Victoria Gatenby, Al Jazeera for Inside Story. Well, let's discuss all of this with today's guests. From the Iranian capital, Hassan Ahmadian is a professor of Middle East and North African studies at the University of Tehran. In Washington, D.C., Trita Parsi, he's executive vice president at the Quincy Institute, that's a U.S. think tank. And from North Wales in the U.K., Khan Ross, he's founder of the Independent Diplomat Advisory Group. Thank you, all of you, for joining us today. Let me start with you, Trita. How dangerous is this moment that we find ourselves in now? This is probably the most dangerous moment that we've faced so far when it comes to a potential clash between Israel and Iran, as well as the risk of the U.S. getting dragged into that war. And this is part of the reason why it's also quite perplexing and surprising to see that even at this moment, the Biden administration's instinct is to go back into a bear hug and express support for Israel without any effort to also put pressure on Israel for it to show restraint and for it not to escalate the situation further. And as long as that is the modus operandi of the U.S. Uh, administration, I fear that this risk will continue to rise. Hassan, let's go back to the first of the month, 1st of April, when this attack happened in Damascus. Just remind us what happened and why... Uh, Iran is so upset about this? Well, it goes against uh, the rules of engagement between Iran and uh, Israel. Uh, it basically uh, goes against, I mean, narrows the gray zone that existed between it, Iran and Israel. They have been in, uh, uh, in an, uh, you know, tit for tat in different ways, indirect attacks 
between Iran and Israel. But this one, this attack is a direct attack by Israel against an Iranian embassy. This is this hasn't happened before, and uh, because it moves uh, the, the the situation between Iran and Israel into a new level of escalation, this is basically different from what uh, the Iranians uh, have been used to in their uh, engagement with the Israelis. Obviously, the Iranians fear that the Israelis are going for a change of rules of engagement that uh, involves escalation that can drag other countries into the conflict between the Iranians and the Israelis, including the United States. And uh, and that's what, what makes it very different from what existed before between Iran and Israel. It killed uh, many Iranian uh, uh, military officers, generals, and uh, it, it, it basically it's one of the biggest military blows to Iran's uh, military advisory role in Syria uh, uh, in the past decade. So that's a, a big change in the uh, engagement between Iran and Israel that has existed for years now. Khan, you used to be a British diplomat until you resigned over the Iraq war. You served uh, on the UN Security Council. When you look at this strike, there's something called the Vienna Convention. There's also the UN Charter. Do you believe that this strike was legitimate under, and justified under international law or not? Well, international law doesn't seem to be very relevant in places like Syria, where Iran is supporting the Assad regime in viciously repressing its own population and using Syria as an avenue for the delivery of weapons to Hezbollah. Um, there's nothing legal about that. There's nothing legal about what Israel has just done to the Iranian consulate. Of course, consulates and embassies are protected by the Vienna Convention. They're supposed to be inviolable. But there's no question that what Israel has done is deeply provocative to the Iranian regime. They have said they regard this as their own soil, and states do regard embassies and consulates as their own inviolable territory. So an attack on your own territory, of course, uh, must invite a response, and that's the situation we see now. Trita, um, Khan used the word provocative. Israel must have known that it was going to get a response after doing this? Certainly, because it's been very clear from the Iranian side that that has been a, uh, a, a red line. And this is part of the reason why the Iranians have justified their lack of response when there's been other attacks inside of Syria or Lebanon that have not been on Iranian uh, uh, consular or diplomatic premises. They have treated those attacks as attacks on Lebanon, on, as attacks on Syria, and not on, as attacks on Iran. Uh, so this is something the Israelis knew very well what they were doing. But it's also another aspect of it that I think was quite clear to them. There has been an uneasy truce between Iran, the United States, and the militias in Syria and Iraq that are close to Iran. Uh, this is following the killing of three American soldiers and America's kinetic response killing numerous militias and the Iranians putting pressure on them to seize attacks on American troops. The Israelis must have known quite well that this would risk bringing an end to that truce, which means that it would bring, uh, uh, put U.S. troops directly in the line of fire and make them targets. And it raises the question as to whether this was not just a provocation against Iran, but a provocation to try to actually drag the U.S. into this. Hassan, um, the Israelis, of course, claim the building was, yes, um, a diplomatic building, but it was actually a base as well for the Revolutionary Guards, and that's proven by who they killed, and that, they say, makes it a legitimate target. Well, that doesn't, basically, uh, uh, under international law. Uh, it's a consulate. It's part of the Iranian embassy, and uh, each consulate has uh, different missions going in and out. It's not uh, the Iranian case in Syria only. I think uh, all countries do that. Uh, uh, so uh, that's an Israeli claim. They are trying to basically say that they targeted Iranian military base, which is uh, simply not true. Uh, and, and because uh, the Iranians have uh, basically uh, received this, I think, uh, and, and they, they didn't expect such an escalation on the part of the Israelis. They are now uh, under immense pressure to do something about it, to deter further Israeli uh, escalations against Iranian missions around the region. 
Khan, let me ask you about the U.S. P p position on this, because the U.S. State Department spokesman Matthew Miller has been asked lots of questions about it. On the 8th of April, he said, we condemn any violations of the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. But he wasn't talking about this. He was talking about Mexico and Ecuador. And then when he was asked about this particular incident, he said, we continue to assess the exact status of that facility in Damascus. And they're trying to work out whether it was a diplomatic premises. Does this look like U.S. double standards to you? Uh, yes, I mean, I think I'm afraid that's pretty clear. Double standards that have been applied repeatedly in the case of Israel's behavior, whether in Gaza or more broadly in the region. The U.S. thinks there's one law for the world and one law for Israel. Uh, but at the same time, there's no question that this attack has, has been very uncomfortable for the U.S. They have repeatedly said they want to avoid a regional war. They want to avoid a war with Iran. And Israel has now put them in a position where they're forced to say that their support for Israel is ironclad and that they would help defend Israel if Iran attacks. That, that's a sort of unequivocal commitment that I think the U.S. would not have made had it not been for this attack. And you know, cynically, one can see that the Israelis have very successfully drawn the Americans into a regional conflict. And if this escalates, we will see U.S. military uh, activity against Iran. And arguably, that's exactly what the Israelis have been seeking for a long time. But it's also particularly uh, relevant for them now, because there was a growing debate in the U.S. about a potential arms embargo on Israel because of its conduct in Gaza, certainly a debate in Europe. And this whole episode with Iran has successfully distracted U.S. and indeed international attention from that issue. And staying with you, Khan, because you know the way the U.N. Security Council works, there was an effort uh, to try and get a statement by the Council uh, condemning this attack, uh, and it was blocked by the U.S., the U.K., and France. Uh, the Iranian foreign minister said that that's one of the reasons Iran has to respond, because the Security Council uh, um, failed to take action. Do you think Iran was looking for some sort of off-ramp and the Security Council, if they had done something, um, could have provided that? It's interesting, uh, because the Iranians do seem to be saying exactly that, that had the Security Council condemned the attack, then they wouldn't be forced to a, a military response. I very much doubt it, and they would have been extremely naive if they ever believed that the Security Council would have condemned such an attack. I mean, America has made repeatedly evident that it will defend Israel in the UN Security Council, that it will block any action condemning Israel's conduct. Uh, and now we see other members of the Permanent Five doing the same. So I think there was not the slightest chance that the Security Council would have condemned the Israeli attack. So uh, there's an element of kind of bluffing about what the Iranians are saying, that, you know, had international law been explicitly put on their side, they would have not militarily responded. I, th I think that's, you know, a rather questionable position. But, Trita, we hear these same countries, the U.S., backed by the U.K. and France, when it comes to the war in Ukraine, repeatedly talking about the rules-based international order. Yes, and incidentally, ever since October 7th, uh, my team at the Quincy Institute ran the numbers. The principles at the U.S. government have more or less ceased to use the term rules-based order. We counted around... 12 instances in which they did use it, and were all in relation to Ukraine. Not a single time has that term been used in relation to Gaza, and for good reason, because the double standard would just be too large for the world to be able to stomach. But let me say one thing about the previous question. I think Karn's uh, assessment may very well be true, but there is a counterexample. In 1998, the Taliban attacked an Iranian consulate in Mazar-e Sharif in Afghanistan. Uh, killed nine or 11, uh, 11 uh, uh, Iranian diplomats. The Iranian mobilized on the border. It was about to go to war, but the message was very clear. If there was a clear condemnation by the entire international community of what the Taliban had done, the Iranians would refrain from going into war, which they clearly didn't want to go into in the first place, similar to this situation. The Security Council did act, did condemn, and the Iranians never went to war with the Taliban. Hassan, perhaps uh, you can give us some of the context of this particular attack, because 
This is not the first time that Israel has launched airstrikes on Iranian targets in Syria. In fact, it's been going on for more than a decade since 2013. Yeah, they have been, and there has been a shadow war between the two sides, uh, uh, specifically on Syrian territories. But uh, so far, the Iranians have talked about Israelis attacking, I mean, uh, Israelis attacking uh, Lebanese and Syrian territories, attacking their bases, and uh, uh, some Iranian advisors were killed uh, uh, as, as a part of that, those attacks. But now they cannot say that. They, they're building, I mean, the, the Iranian embassy was hit, and uh, uh, this is a, an escalation uh, like none before. So it's a totally uh, new, uh, uh, uncharted water for both, I think, the Israelis and the Iranians. The Israelis have moved the escalation to a, a new uh, high, and the Iranians, uh, as I said, they have, uh, they, they, they feel pressure to do something about it. They went to the UN as the first response, and they activated their channels with the United States to uh, uh, to uh, uh, tell them that we are not targeting the states or any other uh, country, basically. We are targeted, and we have a responsibility to react and uh, to deter the Israelis. Uh, the Iranian president's chief of staff said that uh, the message from the United States was that don't attack our uh, assets and uh, forces, uh, and ergo, uh, the message was that well, uh, that's, uh, that that Iranian response should not target the Americans, and the Iranians did not want to target the Americans in the first place. I think they 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 are forced to, and they are planning to retaliate against against Israel, not any other uh, country or any other uh, uh, target. Khan, let's look at the diplomacy that's going on right now. We've seen what's going on publicly. President Biden sent a message to Iran. His words were simply, don't. Um, but we've also had meetings involving uh, the, or, or calls involving the U.S. Secretary of State, who's spoken to the Turkish Foreign Minister, the Chinese uh, Foreign Minister, and the Saudi uh, Foreign Minister. And then... Uh, the U.S.'s allies, the U.K., Australia and Germany, their foreign ministers have all placed separate calls to the Iranian foreign minister. Um, what else do you think is going on? Do you suspect there is also sort of back channels as well? Well, there's certainly a back channel between the U.S. and Israel, which I imagine where the U.S. is saying you have put us in a very difficult position with this airstrike in Damascus. Um, but... You know, diplomacy is largely back channels. It's largely private. We don't know what has been said in these communications between all these countries and Iran. We don't know if they're necessarily amplifying the U.S. message that the U.S. that Iran should not retaliate, because uh, we don't know that they actually support that position. I don't think China has ever seen itself as a mouthpiece for U.S. policy in the Middle East or anywhere else. At the same time. Nobody wants to see a broader confrontation in the Middle East. Nobody wants to see a war dragging Iran in. It will have multiple repercussions, including economic re repercussions for things like oil supplies um, and trade uh, through the region. So there's a big incentive for countries to say to Iran that they should not respond. But again, you know, Israel has put them in a very, very difficult position because Iran feels obliged to respond when it feels, and it has said this, that its own territory has been attacked. Trita, we're hearing the US saying that they think this is imminent. Uh, when people carry out military operations, they normally like to use the, an element of surprise. I mean, would you, you wouldn't expect Iran uh, t to strike right now while everyone is on high alert, would you? Well, remember how the Biden administration used uh, the intelligence it had and went public with it prior to Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. It called out and it made public things that they knew the Russians were planning to do as a way of deterring. So the more that you aside is talking about it and saying it's imminent, uh, it may actually very well be intended to uh, make sure that the Iranians don't attack precisely by depriving them of any uh, element of surprise. I think the Iranians may very well end up dragging this out for quite some time, exhausting the Israelis, exhausting the U.S. We've seen the U.S. move resources to the region, military resources. Israel is on high alert uh, and not strike now, but actually wait some time precisely because it would be more surprising if it happens later than if it happens now. 
Hassan, who makes the decision on this in Iran ultimately? It's the Supreme National Security Council, which uh, is basically the body that uh, is responsible for taking the strategic decisions on uh, issues like this one. And I think uh, that, uh, I mean, uh, taking the rhetoric here from official circles coming out, uh, it seems that there's a decision uh, on, on retaliating, but how to, uh, I mean, the level and where and when is, is is unknown. We know that uh, the, the track record of Iranian retaliations uh, have showed that the Iranians tend to retaliate directly when they are hit directly, and their strategic culture shows as some sort of, uh, you know, strategic proportionality, trying to react uh, on the same level uh, when they are uh, attacked as well. So I think there's a decision on this, but uh, as I said, we, we are not clear on when and how. Trita, there have been some suggestions that perhaps Iran would not target um, Israeli territory, but instead perhaps Israeli-occupied territory, the Golan Heights, or one Iranian official talked about maybe um, Israel's embassies were uh, no longer safe. Um, do, do you think it's possible that they will not target actual is Israel itself, but something um, owned by Israel, as it were? Bottom line is Iran doesn't have a lot of good options. If it were to go after Israeli embassies in the region, it would happen in the context of it actually seeking improved relations with most of its Arab neighbors, including those who are actually hosting Israeli embassies or consulates, and as a result would risk damaging, unraveling uh, the diplomatic investment Iran has made in normalizing relations with those countries and taking benefit from the fact that Israel itself has isolated its itself so tremendously in the region. If it were to try to strike Israeli territory proper, uh, then it would face the difficulty of never having really tested um, uh, Israel's air defenses, the Iron Dome, etc., knowing exactly how it would calibrate such an attack to make sure that it ends up being proportionate and not ending up being uh, uh, so strong that it actually would invite further Israeli escalation and uh, compel Biden to go and do yet another bear hug of Israel, essentially a complete deference to Israel's strategy and complete support, a green light from uh, Washington, a carte blanche that allows the Israelis to design the strategy and the extent of it entirely without any objections from the U.S. Side. Is there a danger, Khan, that Iran could be falling into an Israeli trap in the sense that increasingly Israel is losing so much international support and by then becoming a conflict, rather than the conflict against the Palestinian people, a war uh, between Israel and Iran, they change the narrative completely. Yeah, I think that's very insightful, James. I think uh, Israel is trying to do exactly that. It is trying to shift the story from the atrocities it is perpetrating in Gaza into this broader and very often used narrative of Israel under attack from all sides and it must defend itself and it must call upon its allies to defend itself. You know, even the rhetoric that's come from Israel after they attacked an Is Iranian consulate in Damascus is that somehow they are under assault by Iran, that it's not a kind of reciprocal or a response from Iran. And I think Israel has many motivations for trying to distract attention from what's going on in Gaza, including for its own domestic audience, the fact that it's not really winning in Gaza. It, it, it is not successfully destroying Hamas. There is an upsurge also in settler violence in the West Bank. Many things that Israel would like to turn the world's gaze from and instead reinforce this traditional narrative of Israel under attack from its neighbours. Trita, um... People will be watching this program, some of them not in the immediate region, all around the world. What effects could this, if it becomes an all-out war, have, not just militarily and politically, but on the global economy? Well, it would be absolutely devastating. We've already seen that just the rise in tensions has already pushed up oil prices. If you have an all-out war, and we have to keep in mind that with all of the different wars that have taken place in the region, for the last 30 or so years. None of them were an all-out war in this kind that this would be in, in terms of involving a large number of actors and a large number of theaters. 
uh, we could see uh, oil prices skyrocket. And with the challenges that already exist in the global economy, this would have a depressing effect on the entire globe. There's hardly any country that would not be touched by it. It doesn't matter if they're actually in importing oil directly from the Persian Gulf or not. It will push up oil prices and affect all of the different uh, energy sources that they would be uh, uh, importing. Uh, so this would, every, the entire globe has an interest in preventing this escalation. And I think, again, going back to something I said earlier on, the American strategy supported by the United Kingdom is not one of actual de-escalation. It's a, it's a strategy of allowing Israel to do whatever it wants to do while putting pressure on all of the targets of Israel not to respond. And then they call that de-escalation. That is not de-escalation. It is part of the reason why we have come to this point that the United States has not been even-handed, not that it traditionally has been, but had it from the very beginning put pressure on Israel not to go for a ceasefire, we would not be in this situation today. Hassan, very quickly at the end, just give us a, a feeling of the mood there in Tehran. How worried are people about the situation? Well, uh, I mean, there have been very heated debates here. Uh, uh, all are worried about the day after. If Iran doesn't retaliate, Iran's uh, deterrence vis-a-vis -vis Israel and the United States more broadly will be further rewarded. If it does, it risks escalation that can in include the United States and other parties in the region. So, uh, the, and the Iranians have their plate full. They don't want escalation at this point. And I think they, uh, the Israelis knew that and they acted upon this, uh, uh, this uh, basically calculus. A calculation. So I think uh, uh, none of the options are easy for Iran to uh, uh, basically decide upon, and that's why they are under uh, immense pressure now to uh, whichever direction they uh, take to uh, basically implement moving forward. Thank you, gentlemen. Our guests today were Hassan Ahmadian, Trita Parsi, and Khan Ross. As ever, Al Jazeera aims to give you the most comprehensive coverage of what's going on in the region. And you can also find context and analysis on our website, aljazeera.com. Your views are much appreciated, too. You can contribute on our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. Or find us on X, where we're at AJ Inside Story. From all the team here in Doha, please stay safe. I'm James Bays, and I'll be back here very soon. Bye-bye for now.